I brought five the five love languages to one of my practices that I was very close with. And I said, you know, okay, we're going to just kind of informally change this for the workplace. Well, that's when I stumbled into there actually is the love languages translated to the workplace. Welcome to the Veterinary Blueprint Podcast, brought to you by Butler Vet Insurance, hosted by Bill Butler. The Veterinary Blueprint Podcast is for veterinarians and practice managers who are looking to learn about working on their practice instead of in their practice. Each episode, we will bring you successful proven blueprints from others both inside and outside the veterinary industry. Welcome to today's episode. Hello, everyone. Welcome back to the Veterinary Blueprints Podcast, where veterinary care meets business ownership. I am your host, Bill Butler, and in today's fast-paced world, so many veterinarians uh, face practices, face challenges in attracting and retaining top tier talent. More so, efforts to show appreciation sometimes miss the mark. This leads to frustrations that can erode practice culture and the crucial bond between those practice owners and managers and your staff. But don't worry. For today, we have someone who has decoded this intricate dance of workplace attrici- uh, appreciation, not attrition, appreciation. It helps alleviate attrition. Marie Paps, a top producing sales representative with a career in animal health at Novartis, Alonco, and Beringer Ingelheim, and now is, is representing her own company at Other Centered Growth. She is not only versed in building relationships, but is also a certified facilitator in languages of appreciation in the workplace. This innovative concept mirrors the popular five love languages many of us have heard of. I not so much, I'm just going to be honest, was something that Marie embraced in 2020 to address the critical issues she was observing among her veterinary practice clients. Marie will be sharing her insights on how these languages can bridge the gap, fostering healthy organizational culture and robust employer-employee relationships. So if you've been grappling with talent retention, and I know many practices have, if your gestures of appreciation seem to be falling on deaf ears, then today's episode with the remarkable Marie Paps will be enlightening. So let's dive right in. Marie, thanks for joining us today. Thanks for having me on. It's always good to see you. It is always good to see you. So what's interesting is you and I, as we talked about, uh, we talk about frequently is our connection. My cousin Tim was uh, one of your coworkers for quite some time at a couple of your uh pharmaceutical animal health jobs. And uh, when I launched my book last fall, he got us connected and we've been off to the races since then collaborating um, as uh, in your role in doing what you do and what I do and what I do in the veterinary insurance world. So um, it's been an awesome relationship. And um, we're going to chat today about something that's uh, that's a little more unique that we haven't gotten in, into much much detail on. But why don't you share with our listeners today a little bit about Marie, uh, where you're coming from today, uh, where you're at today, and how you got started in the veterinary and animal services world. Uh, it's it's such an honor to be here talking about this very important topic because it, I found it to be a subject that every one of my practices was struggling with. And it really is, is what, what prompted me to get uh, certified as a languages of appreciation facilitator. So I started in animal health way back. Uh, <laughs> I want to say how many years ago, but it was 2000. I graduated college and joined Novartis Animal Health. And it was such a great opportunity had an opportunity to serve a lot of different animal practices in different capacities, but it was in my role as key account manager with Elanco that I really got to take a much deeper dive into what goes on behind the scenes at, at animal practices. You know, when you're a sales rep and you're slinging vaccines and heartworm and all kinds of other doggy drugs, you know, you, you tend to deal with just the medicine, but that role as key account really let me into what was going on with the practice. And in meeting with the owners and the managers, I was hearing things like we're doing so much for our team. And yet we're still struggling with this lack of appreciation, this culture war where, you know, like no one's happy and there's all this friction. And, and it just got to be really frustrating for them because they felt they were doing so much, but it wasn't landing as intended. So, so while you were doing the pharmaceutical animal health 
gig in 2020, you, you saw the need for this languages of appreciation or just how uh, business owners, practice managers, practice owners were interacting with their team and a disconnect about what they thought they were doing from an appreciation standpoint, but it didn't really come through. So you decided to, to jump in and, and assist them. And um, tell me a little bit about the training or the certification or, or, you know, what really spoke to you about this languages of appreciation? So when I would meet with business owners and, um, you know, the head veterinarians, the practice managers, I would hear them talk about their challenges. And I kept going back to books from, you know, my personal life, my parenting life, my marriage life. And, um, you know, often there would be many books that I could recommend to them that, that came from the, the family personal side. And one that kept coming up over and over again was, you know, the five love languages. And the, the concept is that we each speak love in a, in a different and very unique language. And the concept lands pretty heavy where you're like, if, if I'm in Spain and I don't speak Spanish, I'm going to have a very difficult time communicating. But yet if I did speak the native language, then I would be a ton more effective. Everything would be a lot more pleasant. So I brought five, the five love languages to one of my practices that I was very close with. And I said, you know, okay, we're going to just kind of informally changes for the workplace. Well, that's when I stumbled into there actually is the love languages translated to the workplace. And and I think that's a great relief to anyone with an HR slant because one of the languages is is physical touch. You know, it's obviously we we want to be mindful of that in the workplace. (laughs) Absolutely. Otherwise you're using some of the insurance we sell to our practices, (laughs) Uh, which you don't want to use. All right. So, um, so, for those on the on the podcast today listening, learning about the languages of appreciation for the first time, how would you briefly describe how those five love languages evolve, evolved into the professional ones to keep you out of trouble, and and how did that evolution take place? Yeah, so at a at a really high level, the the five languages are words of affirmation, um, quality time, acts of service, gifts, and physical touch. And all of them have a place in every one of our relationships. And if you dig into this concept, you'll find love languages for children. You know, it, it, it's a wonderful concept. But in the workplace, um, what's exciting about languages of appreciation and what prompted me to get certified as a facilitator is that, um, one, appreciation can be free. And I think that really, really resonates with a lot of practices and sure. cash flow. And, and aren't some of the best things in life free? So I think that first perked up a lot of my practice's attention, like, yeah, free. That sounds great. Um, The other thing is that it's easy to apply. And once you go through some of the concepts, you're like, this is not difficult. You can do um, a fairly fairly light touch on this concept and then apply it throughout the practice and then in your personal life as well. Um, So you know, yes, there are assessments and quizzes where you can take to find out what your languages of appreciation are in the workplace. But what I like to teach the groups is, you know, even in the absence of that quiz, let's go through the high levels and what really is going to resonate with um, with the team. I was on a, a call with some other uh, insurance professionals uh, the other day, and they were talking. We're, we were talking about appreciation in the workplace, and and um. It's, there's one thing that people want more than love or money and it's praise and recognition and just being recognized for a good job. And I think it's so easy as, you know, I, again, this, you know, this podcast is about business ownership and entrepreneurship. I have a team that I have to remember, you know, somebody does a good job. You need to recognize them for that for the, the good job. It's not just, Hey, they did the job they were hired to do. It's they did a good job and recognize that. Right. I think that's probably a lot of what, what this might go to Marie, Marie. So when you're talking about appreciation and the language of appreciation, like free and easy sounds really nice. How do you implement that? And what are some cues that appreciation is needed in an organization? I think oftentimes we we do take for granted that that the team needs to be lifted up and appreciated. And so when when you're walking through the halls of your practice and you're listening with fresh ears, you know, you want to be looking for discouragement, irritability and resistance to policy. You know, when you're rolling something out, there's there's the grumbling. Um, 
want to be mindful of watching for absenteeism, tardiness, you know, because that's really starting to show lack of engagement. And, you know, um, if, if they don't care, why should I care? That starts creeping in. Um, sarcasm, cynicism, apathy, social withdrawal. What if you know? you're just you're describing me to a T. So that sounds like a problem. <laughs> Sarcasm and cynicism. Uh oh, it all it so, all has it all has its place. It all has its place. So when you start to hear those things creeping in, or you notice them, what can you do? You know, again, in that free and easy component, and in the languages of appreciation. So those are the cues. How do you how do you kind of turn that around? And what are some things you can do as as a practice to to stop those things? I think the most important thing is to recognize it's not about the money. And so there, there's this massive disconnect with employers and employees when they're going through exit interviews. Um, you know, 89% of managers think that their people have left for more money when actually only 12% leave for more money. Holy cow. And, I mean, and that's a massive change, especially when a, a business is thinking like, oh, we have to raise our wages. Well, let's pump the brakes on that first. Are there some other levers that we can pull? And what we've found is that it's actually 79% of people are citing lack of appreciation as a massive reason why they're leaving. So, so then, yeah, like let's, let's dig into how do you do that? And um, one of, one of the, um, you know, not every language is spoken in the same percent of intensity. So if we take a look at what people's primary language of appreciation is uh, words of affirmation uh, is 47% of the workforce's number one language. So, Words are free. Um, we don't want cheap words, but but we want authentic words. And so we, we can want start free right words with high value. Exactly, exactly. And you know, you can't just you can't just lose use them lightly. You know, we have to use them with intention. And and there is a way to do it. So the first thing when we're taking a look at words of affirmation is um, how do we do it? And there's there's really three components, and we've got to nail this. Um, number one, we've got to use their name always use their name in that recognition, whether it's a note, um, whether we're talking to them directly, it gets their attention. It just really resonates. And then we need to make sure we're using it accurately. So if we've got someone who has a difficult name, like take the time, learn how to pronounce their name properly. So we want to use their name. The second key component is be specific. And their proper name, right, too. Because, oh, my name's William. I go by Bill. Like, hey, Will, great job. Like, I'm going to look at you like, that's not my name. My name's not Will. I've never been Will. No. And so the nickname or anything else, it needs to be genuine. It needs to be their name because it's that it's that radio station that we're all listening to, WIIFM. What's in it for me? And the number number one thing, you know, if you're in a if you're in a crowd and somebody yells your name, everyone turns because they always want it. Who oh, who's talking about me? So um, that that really hits home uh, for a lot of the the personal growth and professional development I do. It talks about making sure that you're. Um, just from a sales perspective, when you're talking to somebody, you use their name, Marie. Oh, it's so great to meet you. Like, ah, you said my name, you perk up, you immediately pay more attention when your name's used, right? Absolutely. And you definitely want to ask people like, what's their preferred name? And when we find names that, you know, aren't William or Marie, like that's pretty standard. Nobody can really screw that up. Even though I get Mary and Maria all the time, that's cool. But, you know, take the time. If someone's got a you know, uh, a name that you're not familiar with. I had a doctor, um, everyone called him Dr. A, Dr. A. And I was like, I'm going to try a little harder. And it took me a long time, but his name is Dr. Antonichich, right? Like that doesn't just roll off, but it, it was appreciated when, when I could actually use his full name. And so take the time, you know, um, so use their name. Next component is you want it to be specific. You know, what did they do? Um, and then the third, and probably that frosting on the appreciation cake is, what was the impact? Because that's what really seals it. And that's the piece that oftentimes we forget, and that's where the magic is. Stay with us. We'll be right back. This episode of the Veterinary Blueprint Podcast is sponsored by Butler Vet Insurance. Being an insurance agent at Butler Vet Insurance, I've seen firsthand the difficulties veterinarians face insuring their practices. But did you know that we wrote the book on veterinary insurance? It's called Protecting Your Veterinary Practice, Insider Insurance Secrets Every Veterinarian Must Know. It's not just a book, it's a comprehensive guide that speaks to the unique challenges and insurance solutions for the veterinary community. 
With over 20 years' experience from cyber liability to business auto and workers' compensation, our aim at Butler Vet Insurance is to reduce the stress of insurance for those dedicated to animal care. If you're a veterinary practice owner or manager and looking for some guidance on your insurance, follow our insurance blueprint. Discover the Butler Vet Insurance difference, and together, let's put the pieces of the puzzle together. Butler Vet Insurance, reducing the stress of insurance. So, you know, I'm, I'm at a practice, I'm a, a vet tech, and I've done something well, handled a bad, bad uh, patient experience, because uh, those happen all the time. I handled a bad patient experience in a, in a great manner. And uh, how would you kind of convey that to me if, if you give me an example of, of what that would sound like? Yeah, Bill, I'm, I'm so grateful you were here today because when Rosie walked in, like everyone kind of like <laughs> stiffens up when, when Rosie walks in because we know how difficult she is to handle. But man, you really stepped it up. You kept your cool. You were able to handle her so calmly. She didn't even flinch when we went in to do that nail trim. And so, I mean, you put everybody at ease. Rosie felt great. And the owner didn't hear screaming and barking from the lobby. So thanks a lot. So that was free. It yeah. sounds pretty easy. And and so, you know, I think one of the last things that that we'll kind of touch on today is, is there seems to be a disconnect between the effort that gets put in um, into appreciating their team and how employees are interpreting their efforts. So, you know, I might hear that a different way than, than you're, you're putting that out there. So how do you, you know, what's the breakdown or how, help our listeners understand where that disconnect might come from? Cause I might seem like, or I might think, well, I tell them they're doing a great job all the time. I don't know what the problem is. They just walk around here. They're grumpy. They're irritable. They're sarcastic. And I tell them they're doing a great job every single day as the practice owner, but it doesn't seem like it's resonating. So where's that disconnect coming from? It's misusing the golden rule and forgetting that there's actually a better one. There's the platinum rule. So everyone's familiar with the golden rule, do unto others as you would have them do unto you. And so when you walk into the room uh, or your entire world thinking, you know, I think I should be saying, great job. That's what feels good to me. And that's what's going to feel good to everybody. And that is probably hands down the easiest way to go wrong with everyone. And that's what languages of appreciation shares with you is that if we follow the platinum rule, which is do unto others as they would have you do unto them, then that's where it really lands. Okay, so, so let's go back to that uh, words of appreciation. If words of appreciation is my language and uh, there, there's different ways to communicate it. So there's written, um, there's in a small group, there's verbal, and there's in a large group. Well, Bill, if, if you were someone who was absolutely mortified of being called out in front of everyone, which, spoiler alert, most people are, if you hate public recognition and I pull you up to the front of the staff meeting or I put your name on a plaque or a certificate. What did I do wrong? Not only did what did I do wrong, but then some people are like, you know, oh, great. You know, now I'm the brown nose or, you know, however they're feeling. However they're interpreting how that came through. It wasn't received the way I thought it. Like I called them out in front of the team meeting. I told them they did a great job. And instead yeah. they were mortified and they wished it never would have. I wish I hadn't done the good thing. You just train them not again. to do the good thing next time because they don't want to get called out, right? Yeah. So what we want to encourage people to do is, is with the words, you know, you want to start smaller and go bigger. You know, you want to grow into it. And so the first thing I might encourage them to do is, um, you know, make that comment one on one and then see where it resonates. You know, I might sprinkle in a note um, and then and then get a feel for, you know, how public they like it. Um, but that's but that's really important that you give it to the way that they want. Follow that platinum rule. And then where I found that most practices were going wrong is they were doing gifts, which that is the least preferred language. And so, you know, you're hitting everybody up on vet tech week and you want the coffee mugs and the, it, it doesn't land. It's expensive. And the difficulty is it's so not one size fits all, you know? We're getting Starbucks for everybody. I'm a Dunkin' gal. Oh, well, that was a miss, you know? Yeah. Well, and, and, you know, one thing that, that hits me is, is we do some personality testing here at Butler Vet Insurance for our team. And there's, there's one of the, one of the components on the test is, is an economic driver. 
whether somebody's driven economically. And what's interesting is there's actually two economic drivers. There's money, but then there's also time. And if you waste somebody's time, that can they that's worse than telling them that costs a hundred dollars. Like I I would rather pay you a hundred dollars to not have to spend any time with you or have you waste my time. And so I, I'm a high economic, but my economic is time, not necessarily money. So I'm not driven by money. I'm driven by time. And so meeting people where they are is really important. And one thing that that I know has resonated and, and has worked well with me is is those handwritten notes and not delivered at at the at the office, but or or the practice, but mailing that card to their house. You don't have to have a gift card in there. It doesn't have to be that Starbucks card when they're when they're a Dunkin or you know whatever chain where you're at. What's the big coffee shop down in Chicago? I mean, Starbucks obviously is everywhere, but what's the big chain in in Chicago that rivals Starbucks? I mean, it's Dunkin. It's, Dunkin? it's one okay. of the two. Yeah. <laughs> so we have Caribou up here because it was a Minnesota company. That's where they came from. So Caribou is starting to spread out, but. Uh, those are the big com- competing ones. But, you know, back to the the note, the, the other thing with getting that note at home is the significant other, the spouse, it's it's not, you know, you're writing that kind of creepy note back to the bad touch situation. It's it's a professional, hey, you did a great job. We really appreciate you. And it's them getting recognized away from the workplace in front of their loved ones and family. And oftentimes I've, you know, I've done that with my team. Those cards make their way to the office and get put on the desk at the office, even though they got mailed to the house. And so, you know, it doesn't take much, you know, it's a stamp in in three or four minutes. And, And when I write those cards to my team, I sit down and I just take a quiet moment and I reflect what, you know, what do they do? And again, how, how does, how's that going to be received? And, and instead of just, thanks for a great job, Bill, it's, the impact and what they did. And, and, and again, like you, you were talking about meeting them where they are. So what's another way that there, there might be a breakdown happening or, or how can you resonate better as a, as a practice owner or manager when you're trying to, to give some of that appreciation to your team? I think not feeling like it's all on your shoulders as the owner. Um, you know, you're going to have to model this good behavior, but it's really most effective when it's grassroots and it's coming from everyone and it doesn't have to all be you. So, you know, I love how you talk about the currency of time. Um, Quality time is one that resonates quite high in the workplace. And sometimes that means one-on-one with the boss getting mentored, but most often um, if it's quality time, I value time, team building and bonding. Now you got to be careful. Some people see that as forced fun and I just want to get home. The time waster. Yeah. Now, you, yeah, now you're wasting yeah. my time. I, I'd rather be on lunch by myself. Yes. So you have to know like what, what resonates from the time, you know, um, if I'm a big volunteer, if my kids are in little league, you know, so you just have to be really careful that yes, you know what that language is, but what's the dialect. And so, um, you know, I would, I would roll this concept out to the leadership team of the practice and then from there ask them to spread it amongst their circle of influence, you know, the head techs, the managers, head lead receptionists, but then um, catch them being good and appreciating them for appreciating, you know, I saw what you did. Like that really meant a lot to Bill. It can't be a week later either, right? It has to be. Yes. And, and that's a thing. Like it's, it, it does matter to different people and there are some cues, you know, so um, the older we are, the more tolerant we are of the longer it goes. And so like my grandma's, you know, somewhere in heaven being appreciative of me sending my thank you notes. Right. But the younger the generation is, you've got to give up to them faster. And so if you've got a young team, shoot it off in a text. You know, if it isn't within a day or two, you've really lost it. Um, Lost it. Yeah. It can't be when you're remembering it the following Monday, you know, back to the uh, back to the timeliness. Uh, It can't be, uh, you know, Monday when it when it happened on Wednesday, the prior week, like they had a weekend. It feels that might not hit land as well. Talking about that disconnect piece like. Yeah, that was yeah, last like I week. totally forgot. Like, what are you even talking about? You know, they've moved on. Um, but I, I still think like if we're going to make a mistake, I, I'd rather make it in air appreciating and have them be like, well, that was weird. Like, I didn't think that was a big deal. Then not not saying anything at all. Then not even trying. So so if I was a practice owner or manager and I wanted to dive a little bit deeper into this concept, how would I go about doing that? So the 
what's great about it, I think, is this how it overlaps into your personal and professional life. So first thing, I would go to the five love languages website because that free, that quiz there is free. And so what's nice about that is you can go and learn what your love language is and get comfortable with that and kind of play around with that at home. And then there's also languages of apology, which is also pretty fantastic. And then from there- I probably need that. It, I probably need that at home. It has been transformational <laughs> with um, with my family. We all thought we spoke different languages of apology. We all speak the exact same one, but how we deliver it is different. And we're like, oh, oh my gosh, <laughs> that explains so much. Um, but then with languages of appreciation in the workplace, um, you know, there are the books, there are the assessments. Um, what what I host from from time to time are um, webinars where we roll out the concepts at a high level. Um, we'll be doing some soon, so I'll be sure to get that info to you. But, okay. um, but yeah, just going through like what are the languages, what percent are the most common, and then digging into words and how do you how do you get into it a little bit instead of just doing it wrong. Yeah, I keep seeing you offering these, like you've given this talk a number of times at your local Rotary Club, and and I'm up in Minnesota, you're down in Chicago. I was like, man, I wish I could go to, a, maybe I'll go to a Rotary meeting down in in Schaumburg or somewhere in in the Chicago area to uh, to visit and uh, catch one of these live in person. But so you're offering these live in person, and you're also doing some of these online. There's, I'm sure if you Google in the Google machine, languages of appreciation, you'll have no trouble finding this. But I, I just want to thank you, Marie, for your time today, sharing with us some of these insights of languages of appreciation to, to help our practice owners and managers appreciate their team because the the job market's tight. Everyone's worried about where they're going to get their next team member from, and you don't want to have to try and uh, to add more. So um, what's probably the last thought you would leave uh, our listeners today with on what they could do if they just did one thing? After listening to this podcast, what would be the one thing they could do? I would say immediately go practice the words with the three components, name, specific, impact. You will be amazed at what it means personally, professionally, but get out and do that. And when you see the fruits of that, contact me. Let's talk some more and go a little deeper. Perfect. And where can our listeners reach out to you? Where are you online? Where can they where can they get a hold of you? So my agency is Other Centered Growth, and we are at OtherCenteredGrowth.com. Uh, lots of information on languages there. And then uh, we'll be having a lot of events posted, uh, both live and, and virtual. So be on the lookout for those. Great. We'll have some of your contact information in the show notes. You and I are connected on LinkedIn, and I see all your events get popping up on LinkedIn, and I'm just like, oh. I'm missing these in person, but, uh, but thanks so much for joining us, Marie. And thank you for sharing some of your insight and how our practice owners and managers can better appreciate their team, both, uh, both in person and, uh, and in written form and all the different ways without, uh, having it be weird and a, a love language perspective, but a business language perspective. Right. Yes, absolutely. It's, it's free. It's meaningful. It's, it really improves the culture and they'll be glad they invested the time in, in it. It's free and easy, yeah. veterinarians, practice <laughs> managers. It's free and easy. So just invest a little time. Look look out uh, look out on the internet and connect with Marie if you want more information. Well, thanks so much for joining us, Marie, and look forward to connecting with you again thanks soon. Thanks for the invitation, Bill. It's always a pleasure. Thanks for tuning in to Veterinary Blueprints. If you have any thoughts, questions, or suggestions for an episode, I would love to hear from you. Email me at bill at butlervetinsurance.com. Don't forget to subscribe so you never miss an episode. And if you could do me a huge favor, you know it helps with the algorithm. If you can like, share, or comment on the post, leave a review, I would love it. Thanks for tuning in, and until next time.